K advisors want to build a scalable practice, but aren't always sure what to do next. Welcome to Outcomes, the podcast designed to help advisors think, make decisions, and cast a vision to create a business for the future. Here's your host, Ross Marino, financial planner, author, speaker, and CEO of Advisor 2X. Welcome to the Outcome Show. Today, I am joined by Mike Webb, Senior Financial Advisor with CapTrust, formerly with Camac Retirement Group. Hi, Mike. Hi, Ross. How you doing? I'm great. Thanks for being on the show today. As we get started, let's start with your background because you have a, a quite interesting career path, but it also gives you a unique perspective because you understand a financial advisor. You also understand compliance. You understand a lot of technicalities. Really gives you a good perspective. So can you give us a brief history? Yeah, well, I started about 30 years ago. And uh, when I started, you know, things like target date funds were just kind of a, a dream for people. You, you, you know, we didn't have them. Uh, it was a very, you know, back then also it was a very participant centered world. I think my first job um, was like basically copying a lot of participant enrollment forms in the retirement plans <laughs> and, and figure out how carbons work. Remember those? Um, so, um, but obviously I've moved um, quite a bit since then. Um, and I probably had about every every uh, position related to retirement plans from compliance to communications, to customer service, to fiduciary work. And I like to think in now 30 years from now, I've settled, settled upon a happy place. And my, my happy place is primarily being uh, one of the faces of our firm in terms of speaking and being on podcasts like this, and also uh, being uh, kind of a kind of a content aggregator for other folks that they don't have to. So they kind of come to my my social media pages, and I'm going to read like you know you get 100, 200 articles a day, and I'm going to read a lot of them and kind of pick out the five or ten best um, that that I think are worthy of your attention and bring them to you, so you don't have to like you know obviously go through your inbox and figure out what's good. And what's not because there's a lot of not good, and um, and then also obviously drive content myself. I was just uh, just hosted a webinar on uh, cybersecurity, um, you know, constantly writing and trying to be a thought leader um, in the industry. So I came from I came from copying carbon, you know, carbon enrollment forms to uh, to doing this. I think I I think I ended up in a good place. There is so much information that's directed at plan sponsors. Um, some of it's clickbait, some of it's good information. Part of your role is to disseminate that or distill it down and then figure out what you want to share with people. How do you make those decisions on, this is valuable, I'm going to include this, and nah, th this is just clickbait or too technical, non-applicable. What's your process for that? It's actually not as hard as it sounds because you're right, there's a lot of stuff written. Um, there, you could read 100 articles like the next 100 articles in my inbox, I can almost guarantee you 30 of them are going to be on just three topics, probably whatever the flavors of the month are right now. Now it's PEPs, annuities, and quote unquote financial wellness. So, you know, once you get past your fifth article on PEPs, that's good. You probably say, you know, I don't need as many articles to share with my audience on PEPs. So you, so you screen out a lot that way. Um, it's interesting you mentioned clickbait because there's a lot of articles that are just nonsense clickbait. You know, it's like you, they're just designed to get you clicks and there's really nothing behind it. But a lot of those articles, believe it or not, you read the headline and the article doesn't have a lot to do with the headline and actually has some good stuff in it. So a lot of times it's me kind of saying, hey, ignore the headline in this article. You have to go dig, dig deep down into like paragraph four. And that's, you know, that's where you really, that's where the real meat of this is. And that's what you want to pay attention to. So every post I do, I, I never retweet anything. I always quote tweet it or quote post it. So I'm always trying to pointing them. Not only am I kind of giving you the best of the best, but also kind of pointing you out what's what's my observation on it, so that you can kind of center and focus your time on that. And sorry, of course you can read the rest of the article on your own, but part of my job is to kind of bring that stuff to the surface for you, so that you don't have to go hunting for the best stuff. That was a pro tip in there. So you're you're saying you don't retweet. You prefer to just take a quote and then provide a link. Is that right? Well, what I do is I just I take the article and I'll usually I'll usually read it and say to myself, what am I getting out of this article? 
if the answer to that is zero, I'm not tweeting. I'm not tweeting it or posting it in the first place. But if the answer is, wow, this is a really good article, and I'm going to use something esoteric, like on how California state law applies to governmental plans. Yeah, you know, I'll say that. You know, <laughs> I'll quote I'll quote it and I'll say, hey, you know, this is this this is this article makes some real po good points about X, Y, and Z. Or, you know, if you tune into minute 20 of this podcast. Uh, they make a really good point about, uh, you know, about, uh, I don't know, emergency savings. And uh, you know, uh, and usually I'll try to do it with things that you haven't heard a lot about before. Kind of like, uh, I was talking about uh, HSAs in that context, they're kind of the Rodney Dangerfield of, of retirement savings, because like, nobody, nobody really talks about them all that much. But, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll emphasize something that, you know, is a strong point about about that particular thing that you might not have heard before. So I'm I'm really kind of looking for the kind of stuff, not the not the 35 articles on PEPs. Everybody, you don't know what if you don't know if you're following along with me and you don't know what a PEP is by now, you're probably 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 not reading very much of my stuff and getting it. So you want to you want to go into you know you want to go into stuff that says hey hey Mike wow I've never heard of that. If 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 my audience can do that, have that reaction to something, I know I'm I know I'm hitting the sweet spot. There's a trend out there with many firms where they're trying to identify their niche, or they have identified their niche. Maybe it's smaller plans, could be plan size, could be number of locations, different industry groups. There's all different ways to parse the different sectors of our industry. And as an advisor, that's attractive because I can really take the information and say, this applies to you. And the majority of my people, I know it applies to them. You're talking cap trust here. You don't have just one little niche. So I don't think we can say all of this applies to every one of our people. So how do you balance this is only good for a few of our clients versus this may be relevant to everybody. And when you balance it, do you also try to communicate that? That's a very, very good question. Um, the, the part of it, you know, you don't want to ignore any of your audience. So you don't want to have people feel left out. So it's not like I'm going to focus on, like we just use the example of, of California and, and governmental plans. I'm not going to do 30,000 posts on that because obviously I'm excluding smarter amounts. But I am, going to, I am going to pay attention to them because they want to feel like, you know, nobody who has, for example, a nonprofit who has a 403B plan, doesn't want to feel like they're the poor person's 401k. They just don't. They don't want to hear, they don't want to hear that message. So you need to, you need to just, you need to cater to those audiences. And yeah, I know. I mean, if I try to figure out how to cater to every segment of Cap Trust audience all the time, I, I'd probably be doing this 24-7 and that wouldn't even be enough. But I, I but, but you, I think you can strike a happy medium of saying, you know what, I'm going to post about governmental 457 plans sometimes. I'm going to post about um, even, you know, HSAs and, you know, half, the, half of employers don't even have HS, HDHPs, so they don't have HSAs. Because there's interesting stuff about that, that even if you don't have it, you're probably going to appreciate what I write about it. So, so we, so we kind of make it almost where, hey, you know, Mike's going to, I know Mike's not going to write everything that it speaks to me all the time, but he's going to write it in an interesting and informative enough way that even if I haven't, even if I, if it's totally not in my marketplace, hey, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to pay attention. So I think that's how I, I counterbalance it, make it interesting enough and also segment, you know, put out stuff for each audience without oversaturating. And we do that a lot. I mean, that's not just me. I mean, obviously, Cap Trust as a firm does that. They have, you know, they have segmented, you know, they have segmented newsletters and different kind of in different kind of communications that goes to different um, target audiences. And obviously, they have so many different targets. It, 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 like I said, it's another one of those things that sounds hard on paper, but when you actually get into the nuts and bolts of doing it and understanding your audience, I think that's key. Then, then it becomes an easy job. What's going on right now that you're looking at it and thinking, this is building, this is growing, and because of it, you're actually excited about it. Can you zero in on anything that gets you excited today? <laughs> well, there's a there's a lot that gets me excited, but I think 
making making good plans better. Um, and I think, believe it or not, Congress kind of got it right with most of the proposed Secure Act 2.0 uh, that's coming out. Um, a lot of that is about making a good plan better. Um, you know, getting just getting rid of annoying things and improving improving other things. Now they threw a bunch of stuff in the end to raise money for it, which is not about making a good plan better. And hopefully we get rid of some of that stuff, and I think we will. But I think secure 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 act you know, gets me excited. Um, the ability, the general ability to make good plans better. I think plan sponsors are finally starting to get it. Um, the old days of plan sponsors spending their entire due diligence meeting on investments appear to be over uh, for the most part. I think people are finally starting again. This is about creating wealth and retirement plans. For young people, that has nothing to do with investments. Zero, nothing. Contributions are going to greatly exceed any investment return that they have uh, until they get probably to about six figures. And as we know, in most plans, most people don't get the six figures before they move on to another job. So really, the, the stuff that really excites me is how am I going to, how I'm going to use things like emergency savings, even HSA, I guess, esoterically, um, cutting debt, all those things that make people um, more financially independent. How are plan sponsors kind of going to use those things to their advantage to make good plans better going forward so that, you know, the, the people who are in them, you know, because we talk about, you know, this, this wealth management, you know, what's wealth management for? Individuals who become wealthy. But let's, wouldn't it be great if we just take everybody who's in retirement plans? Because it's not hard. It's not rocket science. Save early as you can, as much as you can. Profit. So if we get all those people to do that and we create wealth in the retirement plan, we create wealth management clients, essentially, wouldn't that be such a great thing? And to me, that's the, that's the fundamental fiduciary purpose of retirement plans anyway, to act in the best interest of participants and beneficiaries. What's the best way to act in their best interest? Make them wealthy. Seems pretty simple. Now, you're, you're defining the shift from just the plan sponsor and the plan to the participant. And in our previous conversation, conversation, you had talked about that really influenced the decision of CAMAC joining CAP Trust. So could you talk a little bit about what led up to that? Yeah, absolutely. And remember, we, we started the, um, the conversation about my 30 years. And my 30 years has been dedicated to plan sponsors. You know, that's my, that's our client. That's my client. All that time at CAMAC. Um, we started realizing, just as I said, that we're evolving. You know, plan sponsors are evolving. They want to act in the best interest of participants, beneficiaries. They want to grow that well. How do we do that? Well, it's not a it's not a magic wand, so to speak, but it involves uh, a lot of hard work. The hard work involves making people who are not financially well financially well enough to to save for retirement. That's a participant piece. Now, now my client has to be the participant for that to work. Now I could do that through the plan sponsor, but at the end, at the end of the day, I better be making the end user create wealth. So how do I do that? Well, if I don't have any sort of financial wellness platform, then I have to build one. And that's going to cost a lot of money. Or I could go somewhere to Cap Trust where ding ding. They've been catering to participants for, for decades and to plan sponsors. So I don't have to build one anymore. So, so pretty much, pretty much a no-brainer in if you looked at the natural evolution of our firm, the next level was going to be taking the participants and creating and creating wealth for them so that they become people who are, you know, are they've they've achieved the success metric. And you know, we you only get so far in doing that with choosing which XYZ target date fund you have in your plan. <laughs> and that's a lot of what we were doing. So as we evolved, we needed that, we needed to join join forces with somebody to do that. And I don't see that trend of joining forces changing anytime soon. I, I think the value proposition of joining an organization, partnering with an organization, or simply leveraging technology and outsource partners 
in order to grow your practice. Um, I don't know how the practices that try to do most everything on their own can compete. I, I just don't, I can't make sense of that in my head that this is how you prosper over the next three to five years versus these groups that are combining together and leveraging each other's talents and skills. So I, I, I think that's a trend that's gonna continue. But for a lot of people out there, they think about joining a firm or partnering up. It's kind of scary because there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of unknown. And we always have expectations going in. And then afterwards we say, well, I was, you know, I was right about that and didn't quite see that coming. And you know, that was a little harder than I thought. Can you talk a little bit about the transition from CAMAC to Camp Trust and uh, Cap Trust and anything surprise you along the way? Um, I, I, wouldn't say I wouldn't say surprised. Um, but, you know, it's it, it's kind of interesting because it's always the unknown, right? I mean, as much as like I'm like, hey, I want to make I want to make new friends. I don't know if those new friends want to make new friends with me, you know. <laughs> so, you know, you go in and you're like, you're like, wow, you know, this is this is this could be scary. But um, I think actually what was surprising was how kind of easy it was. I think when you find when you find like-minded people um, who are kind of trying to accomplish the same thing you're trying to accomplish, I don't think it's, I don't think it's so bad. It's not like, you know, it's not like we joined, you know, a life insurer or some kind of, you know, you know, it's like, you know, this is the same business. They were, they were our competition basically. So, you know, when you go in and you, you, you take it from that perspective, um, I think the surprise was how, how smoothly it went in terms of the transition. Um, I mean, I guess in terms of another surprise maybe was probably kind of the depth that a cap, that a large organization like a cap trust has. I mean, you're talking from us coming, you know, from a under 50 person organization to our organization. I think, you know, it's almost, it's almost moot to talk about. I think we have about 900 employees, but I think that's almost moot to say because probably next month we'll have more, you know? So, um, but to go to that, you would, you would normally, you would, you would normally think, yeah, there's going to be, it's a big company, but am I really going to get, am I going to really going to get what I want out of it? And for me, it's been that bench strength. It's kind of like, there are more Mike webs now, you know, there are people I can bounce off ideas on. I'm not the be all and end all of everything. So when I make a mistake, it's not the end of the world because someone can say, hey, Mike, you know, here's a different perspective on that. So I think that's what you get. I was really kind of surprised that there's just so much of that you get with a larger firm. And I do, I have so many hats, as we've talked about. I have a content aggregator. I'm a subject matter expert. I'm a speaker. Well, there's people there, you know, there's people there who speak all the time on different subjects. So I can learn from them and maybe they can learn from me. I don't know. <laughs> Well, I think a lot of people can learn from you. So I'm just going to use that as a setup for a, another question. How about two to three best practices? So for financial advisors out there, they're in the business, they're trying to take care of their sponsors and participants. How about two or three nuggets of, here's a couple things that I think will really help you in your practice. Yeah. Um, kind of gaining, to me, number one is always being the true trusted expert. I think there's always a difference that between being an advisor and being a trusted expert. I think, you know, individually I've made, you know, I, I mean, I write a column called Ask the Experts. So I, I like to think, it sounds like at least some people think I'm an expert on something if they gave me a column called Ask the Experts. So, so I, and I think I've done that in my practice by really kind of, you know, kind of saying, okay, Here's what I, I want to focus on outcomes because if I focus on outcomes, if I, if I, and, and it can be just at a micro level, I'll give, I'll give you a little example. Let's just say we just did a, we just did a webinar on cybersecurity and I used an example there of uh, if you, if you're looking into your plan and, and more than 50% of your folks or your participants have never logged into their accounts, that's not a great thing. So, so, so let's, so let's just say I take that, I go to a client, I take a new client, I take that, and I do an initial assessment. And let's say 70% of their folks aren't logged in. Well, now I've got, I've really got a hook to become a trusted thought leader kind of expert. Because if I could take that 70 and even move it down to 60, say within a year, 
that gains, to me, that gains trust. So you gain, again, trust through outcomes. It's not so much, you know, like being an encyclopedia, you know, the expert thing kind of applies to what you know and everything. Nobody wants to hear your resume or what you know. They want you to be able to improve outcomes. And if you improve outcomes, you gain their trust. So I think definitely one is outcomes. Two is probably focus. Um, and it's kind of funny I'm saying that we're working for CapTrust because we have so many audiences. But, but you can pick out as an advisor, hey, you know, I'm particularly good at this audience. And I'm still better at some audiences than others. You know, it's a, that's not a shame. I can't be in, you know, I can't be the absolute best for every single plan sponsor out there. It's, there's no shame in saying, looking at your book and saying, hey, where am I really, where am I really going to shine? I can tell you, I've, I've, we've had books of business where we had no, we had no penetration. And then we were like, you know what, we could really shine here. And then that became our largest book, you know, the largest part of our book. So you really need to look at that book and say, you know, where can I really shine here? Are there niches where I can improve outcomes again? And make it and make it and make it really shine. It's kind of like you know, how do I turn that average plant sponsor? And this is my kind of my third point. How do I turn that average plant sponsor into a best in class, an award winning client? Because again, and again, these are all tied together. This goes back to the trust. You know, if I can figure out that that formula, for my third point, which is how to make good clients. Into, maybe not even into the award-winning clients. Well, let's just make good clients into better clients. Again, that goes back, it goes back to the trust. And then it goes back to me being um, someone who said, oh, hey, you know, Mike Webb did that with XYZ governmental client. You know, I bet he can do that with us. I bet he can do that with us too. So I think if you if you if you kept your eye on those things and got rid of the rest of the noise, because there's a lot of noise in all of our days. Just some people feel like they're just treading water all the time. And I hear you. I'm not here to say that I have the panacea. But if you could just spend a little of your day thinking about those three things, I, I think as an advisor, you'd do a lot better. So let's do the final question. It is the magic wand, Mike, for those of you watching on YouTube or on your phone. It's a magic wand that came straight from Disney. And as far as you know, it works magically. So if you could wave it, Mike, change anything in the world, what would you do today? That's actually a very easy one for me. Um, get rid of uh, required minimum distributions. Um, uh, for the unfamiliar, uh, they are the, the uh, what I call uh, very painful <laughs> um, requirements in the code right now that say, uh, hey, seniors, you know, you don't got enough worry, to worry about in retirement. If you don't uh, take out a certain amount of money by the time you're now 72, and it used to be even worse, 70 and a half. We used to have, we used to have actually have seniors memorize fractions, which is like, hey, that was a really good idea. Let's bring it back. Let's bring it back to grade school. You know, that's that's, that's just a great concept. Um, but at least it's 72 now. You've got to start taking a little bit of money. And if you don't, the IRS is going to beat you over the head with a hammer with draconian penalties if you don't. That is, I mean, Think about re qualify retirement plans. There's not people make this, these are not billion dollar tax shelters that the super uber wealthy are taking advantage of. These are you, you know, these are average ordinary workers who've done a good job accumulating retirement wealth. Why are we, why are we telling them, well, by April 1st, following the year in which you turn 72, you're going to have to remember to take a little bit out and then take a little bit more out next year and then take, or else you'll pay these. It just makes absolutely no sense to me. Now, I know why the IRS does it because they want to get their money, but they're going to get their money anyway. They got rid of all the all the fancy stretch IRA, you know, stretch IRA rules that allowed, you know, heirs to kind of indefinitely postpone the income. Those are gone. So when when these people die, their heirs are going to pay money. They're going to pay taxes anyway. So the IRS is going to get their money. I just think it's just kind of it's almost like senior abuse, you know. Um, and, and I've been railing on this for quite some time. Uh, and fortunately, some other industry professionals have now come out and said the same thing. I kind of thought I was kind of shouting at walls, basically. But I just, I really think it's terrible. It's a great answer. Mike Webb, thanks so much for being on the show today. Thank you, Ross. Thank you for listening to Outcomes. Subscribe now to be notified when new episodes become available. 
The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Advisor 2X. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service providers with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Shaping Change by Ross Marino and Susan Bradley. Well, I've really lived the whole theme of the book. Any advisor will tell you they've seen clients go through this where they have plans one day, you wake up the next day, and the plan is scrapped because life happened and the plans need to change. Get your copy of Shaping Change by visiting shapingchangebook.com.